Well, good morning and welcome to our intergroup session on structural breaches of the regulation 1-2005 on the transport of unweaned calves. We are joined today by um, the Chief Policy Advisor of Compassion in World Farming, uh, Peter Stevenson. Uh, welcome, Peter. Uh, and also the founder of Ethical Farming Ireland, uh, Carolyn Rowley, and also by Nicola Glenn. Uh, um, she is the UK and Ireland uh, spokesperson for Eyes on Animals. This intergroup session will focus on the experience of unweaned uh, calves during transport, uh, particularly looking at the unweaned calf trade in the EU, as well as video footage uh, of calf exports from Ireland. Uh, Regulation 1 2005 on the protection of animals during transport is currently under review, as you all know, and there have been many breaches of the protection uh, uh, afforded to, to unweaned calves. And this needs to be given uh, the spotlight to ensure um, uh, it is given the necessary attention during the legislative review. We will first listen to both presentations. Uh, then we will hear to, uh, with Tilly Metz, uh, our candidate for president of the Animal Welfare Intergroup for the second half of this term. Uh, and this will be followed by her likely appointment. Uh, before we start, as usual, uh, I'd like to highlight some practical aspects for the running uh, of this short session. Uh, this meeting is live streamed. Uh, on, on Facebook and the meeting will be recorded. Uh, the video recording and the presentations will be sent to all participants afterwards. The debate will, as, as always, be moderated by uh, Reineke Hameleers from the Intergroup Secretariat. Uh, please keep yourself unmuted during uh, the whole meeting and you can add your questions using the Q&A box. Uh, they will be addressed at the end of the session um, or if you are an MEP and you wish to take the floor, please um, let us know by using the chat box or uh, raise your hand button. Um, given the short time at our disposal, I would like to ask all colleagues, uh, of course, to be as brief as possible with their questions and statements. Uh, well, let's go immediately to the presentations on this important topic of uh, transport of calves. Uh, I will now first give the floor to Mr. Peter Stevenson. Uh, Peter, the floor is yours. Hello, I, I assume you can hear me. Uh, I'm giving this presentation on behalf of both Compassion in Well Farming and Eyes on Animals. Each year, 1.4 oh, for some reason, my presentation is not moving on when I try to when I try to click it. Has anybody got any advice? I'm going to stop maybe, sharing. Yes, maybe it. stop sharing and then try it again, Peter. Yes, because it's been it's been working all morning. Let me. Yeah. Uh, I'm just going to try another version of it, which means taking it back to the beginning and right let's see if this works any better if it's yes not working, right. we can share it okay great Good. each year around 1.4 million unweaned calves are transported between the member states in 2020 the netherlands imported 740,000 calves for its veal industry and of these 150,000 came from distant countries, from Estonia, Lithuania, Latvia, and Ireland. Also in 2020, 98,000 calves were sent from Poland, Lithuania, Czech Republic, and Slovakia on massive long journeys to Italy and Spain. And another 136,000 calves were sent to Italy and Spain from Germany, Austria, Netherlands, and Ireland. Shockingly, Regulation 1 2005 permits the 
transport of calves aged less than 10 days for up to 100 kilometers. It allows calves aged from 10 to 14 days to be transported for eight hours. And once calves are over 14 days, they can be transported from one end of Europe to another, uh, provided they're given certain rest periods. And permitting the transport of these fragile young creatures on such long journeys is inhumane. I want to look uh, in a bit more detail at what the regulation says about the transport of calves aged over 14 days. It begins by setting a maximum journey limit of eight hours. But then it goes on to say that calves can be transported for much longer if after nine hours transport, they're given a rest break of at least one hour so that they can be given liquid and if necessary. It's these words, if necessary, that have caused so many problems. So what we've got is the calves can be transported for nine hours. Then they must have this one hour rest break so they can be, if necessary, fed. Then the regulation allows them to go for another nine hours. Uh, then they must be unloaded uh, and given feed, water and 24 hours rest. And then they can be transported for another nine hours, given a one hour break for, if necessary, to be fed and transported for another nine hours. Now, this table uh, contains data uh, produced by the Animal Welfare Foundation from their investigations. You can see that the, the journeys from Poland to Spain and Italy can take 28 hours, from Lithuania to Spain, 43 hours. So clearly many of these journeys are going to use three of the permitted nine hour transport slots, some will even use four. The key question uh, is, are the calves actually being fed after nine hours transport during the one hour break? Now, feed for unweaned calves, it's not solid, it's liquid feed, it's milk or milk replacer, which is milk powder that's mixed with water uh, just prior to feeding. Now, the calves, are almost never unloaded from the truck during the one hour break. And so they're almost never given a milk replacer because it's widely recognized that it's not possible to feed milk replacer to calves that are on board a truck. And indeed, the guide to good practices for the transport of cattle, a document commissioned by the commission says that the provision of liquid feed to calves in transit is considered to be impractical with current truck design. Because the calves are not fed after nine hours, uh, under the regulation, the member states must not authorize journeys over uh, eight hours. In practice, many member states ignore the fact that the calves are not fed after nine hours and allow very long journeys to take place, even though they are in breach of the regulation. Some member states try to justify this by saying that it's not necessary for calves to be fed after nine hours. But let's look at what happens if they're not fed after nine hours. The last feed bef be before the start of the journey is likely to be about three hours before loading. Then they're going to be transported for nine hours, given the one hour break during which they'll not be fed. Then they'll be transported for another nine hours. And finally, they'll be unloaded for the 24 hour rest and feed. This means that if they are not given feed after that first nine hours during the one hour break, they're likely to go for at least 22 hours without feed. And in many cases, it may be more because quite often the last feed before the start of the journey is much more 
than three hours uh, before loading. Now, if calves are going for this long without feed, they will suffer greatly. Unweaned calves have almost no feed reserves. So if they have to go for 22 hours or more without feed, they will experience hunger and fatigue. Unweaned calves uh, are not able to control their body temperature well. So if they're without feed on a long journey, they'll be more susceptible to heat and cold stress. Uh, young calves haven't yet got fully developed immune system. So lack of feed on a long journey will undermine their immunity, which is already under severe stress from being transported. Most of these cars are being transported when they're two to five weeks old, precisely when they're in an immunological gap. They're no longer protected by maternal antibodies, but they do not yet have a fully developed immune system of their own. And again, all this is recognized by the, the guide to good practices for the transport of calves, which says that young calves uh, have to be provided with feed water after as little as eight to nine hours. Many of these transported calves don't just not get any feed, they go without water for some 20 hours. And that's because the calves don't know how to use the, the metal drinking nipples provided on many trucks and the very high stocking densities mean that many of them are unable to reach the drinking devices. So in conclusion, given all these problems and, and the fact that the regulation is breached on the majority of long journeys, I urge the plenary to uh, adopt the recommendation of the ANIT committee, which is that Unweaned calves should not be transported at all until they're five weeks of age, and that even then, the maximum journey limit should be just two hours, uh, as long as they remain unweaned. And the commission uh, has said that calves should be classified, regarded as unweaned until they're two months of age. I think it's an excellent recommendation. I hope the plenary will adopt it. Uh, thank you very much. That's the end of my presentation. Well, thank you so much, uh, Peter, for this uh, informative presentation. Uh, the numbers and, and the journey times are still unbelievably high and, and always uh, shock me. Uh, I don't see any urgent questions uh, for now, so I propose that we will uh, continue with our next uh, guest. Um, uh, that is Caroline Rowley, uh, whose presentation will focus on the unweaned calf trade in, in Ireland. And as you all know, Ireland is an island and, and there is uh, also uh, a sea transport involved here. So this uh, needs uh, also special attention from, from our side. Uh, Ms. Rowley, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um... Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I've been working with Eyes on Animals for a few years now in relation to calf export, and we welcome the opportunity to present to you this morning. Um, Peter has already gone over the health and welfare impact of long distance travel on unweaned calves and the impracticality of feeding calves in transit. So I'm going to give an overview of the trade from Ireland that has been systematically breaching EU regulation 1 2005 for decades with regard to feeding requirements. Since milk quotas were abolished in 2015, the dairy sector has been increasing significantly, with calf births exceeding 1.5 million this year, half of which are male and of little value. Calf export has also increased greatly, with the majority going to fuel farms in Spain and the Netherlands. Tagush, the Irish semi-state advisory and research body, has been actively encouraging farmers to move into dairy or increase their dairy herds. To produce milk, of course, a cow must, a cow must first produce a calf. 
something that just wasn't thought about when increasing the dairy herd was encouraged. In peak calving season, you'll see male dairy calves on offer for as little as one euro each. And they've even been offered for free. In 2019, in relation to this issue, Tagish Dr. Pat Dillon stated, believe it or not, we never considered the outcome of the dairy calves. Indeed, they did not. I'm going to show a short video that gives some insight into the reality behind the trade. As you can see, <clears throat> far from the high welfare industry that we are told about, it is one steeped in cruelty and suffering. What differentiates Ireland from other member states is the fact that we are an island, and so every export involves an 18 hour ferry journey. Given that the regulations states calves must be fed after a maximum of 19 hours, as Peter has explained, and that calves must be unloaded to be fed, which cannot happen on the ferry, it's just not possible to export calves from Ireland legally. Calves are often exported directly from a mart, and during an investigation in 2020, we observed calves at Bandon Mart in Cork being loaded onto trucks at around midday. The mart had been held the previous morning, meaning those calves had been there for over 24 hours. Eyes on Animals have a whistleblower who is an Irish calf exporter, and he claims the calves are only fed once whilst at the mart, because it costs two to three euro per calf to feed them. And when you have a consignment of around 300, that's a lot of money. Um, we have no idea uh, how much the calves are being fed or when their last feed is before loading. We spotted the same trucks at Ross Airport several hours later and the ferry wasn't due to leave until nine that evening, meaning those calves were on the truck for nine hours before the, even boarding the ferry. Calves travel from all over Ireland, including Northern Ireland, and it is common to spot trucks full of boarding calves at Dublin and Ross Airports several hours before the ferry is due to leave, already hungry, tired and stressed. After an 18 hour long ferry journey contending with excessive noise, bright lights and exhaust fumes or cold winds if on the outer decks, the calves finally arrive at the control post in Cherbourg, visibly exhausted, starving, dehydrated and confused, only to be subjected to rough treatment and abuse. They may also have to wait several hours more before they actually get fed. L214 and Eyes on Animals have conducted two investigations at the control post and each time they've exposed terrible treatment of calves indicating that this is the norm rather than the exception. The calves are supposedly rested for 13 hours in a noisy, crowded, unfamiliar environment before being loaded back onto the trucks where they to continue their journey and they may go as far as Poland. These journeys normally take a total of 50 hours or more. The image portrayed by the Irish authorities and the industry is one of high welfare and strict regulations, but it is clear this is not the case as even basic feeding requirements aren't being met. New guidelines introduced in 2019 included extra space, rubber teats on the water dispensers, and a vet should accompany the calves during peak season. None of these guidelines address the feeding issue. These images taken this year at Ross Airport are just some of many showing that the, the trucks don't have rubber teats on the water dispensers and they're not at the correct angle for the calves to suckle. And despite the extra space, the calves are very cramped, no headroom, 
and they've barely enough space to lie down, which they like to do during transit. There's been a lot of talk this year about slow release feed, as if it is a solution, but there is no derogation in the regulation for this, and inquiries have not shown any evidence that such a thing exists that would keep calves satisfied for these excessively long journeys. A mortality figure of 0.05% has also been published by the authorities this year as some kind of indication of good welfare. But when I've requested the mortality rates under the Freedom of Information Act, I was told it wasn't recorded, so I don't know where that figure came from. Anyhow, Professor Broom from the Department of Veterinary Medicine at Cambridge University stated in a report on this subject that few of such calves will die, but their welfare will be poor as their needs are not being met. Every truck that leaves the country must have a journey log stamped by the authorities that must be returned within 30 days. And I've obtained many of these under the Freedom of Information Act. 80% of the journey logs received this year do not include the loading time, which should be there in section two. The clock starts ticking as soon as the first animal is loaded. So it's very important for this information to be recorded so we know how long the animals are on the truck for. More worryingly, 90% of the journey logs don't have section three completed where it should log how many animals arrived fit and how many died. And this section should be stamped by an official veterinarian. So it's not possible to work out the mortality rate when the deaths are not being recorded by the transporters. Also 10% of the journey logs re requested couldn't be located at all. We have raised this issue with the authorities and it was meant to have been dealt with, but clearly that's not the case. There's been a committee of inquiry into long distance transport over the last 18 months and at a hearing in February, there were surprise, some surprising claims made by a senior official from the Department of Agriculture and a prominent calf exporter. So Robert Doyle, the Director of Animal Welfare stated, while it is true that currently feeding the animals during their journey on the lorry is regarded as technically impracticable, the MOVE research project on calf transport is considering ways in which this might be carried out. Alternatives are also under consideration, such as a slow release, high energy meal before departure. So on one hand, the authorities are claiming it's the a strictly regulated industry with high welfare. And on the other hand, Dr. Doyle is admitting the calves aren't being fed during the journey, which is a direct breach of the regulation. He also stated exporters are required to return their journey logs to the department where they're examined by our experts. I just showed the majority of journey logs aren't being completed properly or they're not returned at all. And a surprising statement was, Irish, ofi Irish official veterinarians have accompanied calves on the voyage to Cherbourg and onwards to destination in Spain and have monitored welfare en route. I put in a freedom of information request for copies of the um, reports from these journeys to Spain, only to be told that there are none. There has been no journey to Spain accompanied by a vet. In 2018, there was one occasion where a vet traveled to Cherbourg and the same in 2019. On both occasions, the vet only went as far as Cherbourg port. He didn't travel to the control posts. He didn't observe the calves being unloaded. Therefore, the authorities cannot make claims about calves arriving in good condition when they just don't know. Seamus Scanlon claimed that um, he set up a welfare committee for exporters and only members can get bookings on the ferries or at the Lairage, which isn't true. I checked with our contact at ferry operator Stenaline and they didn't know anything about this committee. And again, slow release feed was brought up, claiming it can take 17 hours to digest. When asked about this subject, Dr. Ronald Rongan, a cattle behavior expert, stated that there is milk powder with extra fat and energy but would not keep calves satisfied for more than 12 hours and remember these calves are going 24 to 30 hours with no feed but this is irrelevant anyway because there's no derogation in the regulation for slow release feed. I'm referring to these hearings because when I spoke at one in March one MEP was very surprised at what I was saying as she had been led to believe that standards were very high and the feeding issue had been dealt with which isn't the case. When a concerned member of the public contacted Stenner after witnessing trucks full of boiling calves at Rosslea Port, Stenner said, we are currently in discussions with the government on how to bring this sector into line with EU regulations, but this has taken longer than we anticipated and is still ongoing. So there we have further confirmation that these journeys are not being conducted in line with the regulation. Several NGOs have been complaining to the commission for years, but our complaints have been ignored. Leslie Moffat from Eyes on Animals and myself have both submitted formal complaints to the Commission and we've received this response. You state that it is not possible to feed unweaned calves when inside the roll on roll off ferry. However, you provide us with no actual evidence that the feeding of unweaned calves is impossible or not taking place at all in the journeys approved by Irish authorities. The European Commission cannot start any infringement procedure without clear and sufficient evidence of the alleged infringement by the Member State. We provided all the evidence we can, you know, I don't know what they want. 
And we've explained that the Irish authorities have never claimed that cars are being fed during transit, but we just keep getting the same response back. In contrast, a recent communication from the Commission to the Irish authorities acknowledges that the calves are not being fed and that it is a serious welfare issue. They said, the exposure of unweaned calves, usually fed twice a day to long fasting periods, increases the risk to cause injury or undue suffering. I would welcome more information on the way the Irish authorities consider addressing the issue in the future. I suggest presenting a roadmap to replace, reduce and refine the transport of unweaned calves over journeys that exceed 19 hours. I duly appreciate that this issue is complex and has important economic implications. The fact that there are important economic implications is no excuse for breaching the regulation or causing undue suffering. The Commission also says, I'm conscious that practices cannot be changed overnight. But these breaches have been going on for decades and complaints have been going on for decades, so it's very frustrating. And it does bring to question what is the point of regulations when they're not enforced and there's no consequences for continuous breaches. In conclusion, not only is the Irish calf export industry being conducted illegally, it is inhumane, causing great suffering to very young and vulnerable animals. We're told that any changes to the regulation must be based on facts, not sentiment. Well, these are the facts. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Caroline. Uh, and thank you, Ethical Farming uh, Ireland, and also uh, Eyes on Animals and Elder San Catars for their ongoing investigations uh, in the calf transport. And, and without this footage uh, that you showed us, um, we would not know what we know today and uh, about all these well, these grueling journeys of unweaned animals. Um, and this has been an incredi incredibly eye-opening um, uh, uh, two presentations and, and also the fact that Ireland is constantly for, for structural for years now is breaching the European legislation. So I am quite sure that there are um, uh, a lot of colleagues who want to intervene uh, so I will now go over to Reineke to moderate the debate. Reineke, the floor is yours. Thank you, Anja. And um, after these harrowing presentations, it's good to see that there are a lot of MEPs um, who've joined us today and who would also like to come in and, and ask questions. And I know you would also like to come in later. So firstly, I would like to invite um, MEP Niels Fugelsang uh, to, to intervene, please. Niels? Thank you very much, Heineke. Thank you, Anja. I hope you can hear me. And yes. uh, great. And thank you to the experts and the ex excellent interventions. Um, I have a couple of questions. And I think in general that what you are saying uh, strengthens my belief that we need to adopt um, the recommendations uh, of the ANIC committee uh, to stop the transport of unweaned animals. Um, and we also need um, to have the eight hours limit in there, in the recommendations from the end committee. And that was still, we just lost that by one vote. It was a tie actually in the end committee, but we can, we can uh, try to, to push that in the plenary. Uh, I would like to ask you first, um, all the, uh, violations of the uh, regulations that the second presentation uh, documents and explains how um, how can we what can we do about that what is the one most efficient action we could take against that according to you you we've seen breaches in Ireland going on for years and we've seen that the commission doesn't act on it uh, what's the purpose of having a regulation if uh, it's just being breached systematically and uh, that nobody, the authorities don't act on it? Uh, what would your proposal be here? Uh, then uh, for Peter Stevenson, I have a couple of questions. Um, I would like Peter to ask you, um, what do you think about, uh, I heard that some, and actually also I've also seen when we were in a mission in Denmark with the ANI committee that some farmers, they train uh, the young calves in, in drinking milk um, from a bucket or from a system, uh, drinking system. Um, 
before they can go on the journey. What do you think about this? Is this possible? Um, could that solve some of the problem according to you? And then I would like to ask you about um, the two hours proposal that you have and, and that indeed we also have in our recommendations, the two hour maximum transport for these unweaned calves. Uh, why, um, what's the argument basically behind two hours? Is there any specific reason for two hours and not one and not three hours? Well, what is your argument? Um, Yes, and then perhaps uh, just a question to, uh, I know Anya and perhaps Thomas was also there as the shadow rapporteurs um, because you negotiated with this in the any committee to have a ban on long transport of unbeamed animals. And some, some groups uh, and some politicians are against such a ban. And um, perhaps you could just uh, come in, Anya or Thomas, if Thomas is here, what are the arguments against such a ban? Uh, that you heard from these politicians, because listening to to the two presentations here, I think it's hard to uh, argue for these kind of long tra transports. So, if you have any information here, it would be interesting to hear. Thank you. Thank you so much, Niels, for these uh, very valid uh, questions. Firstly, it would be good to hear from you, uh, Caroline. Uh, about what would be needed. And it would also uh, be really good if you could shine your light on the ANET uh, report's recommendation as if you think that um, uh, limiting the transportation uh, to two hours and only uh, after five uh, weeks would solve the issues uh, you are facing. Thanks so much. And then we, we go to, to Peter. Um, <clears throat> okay. Well. That is a good question about you know what can we do if the regulations repeatedly being ignored that's you know that that's it's just it's so frustrating what can we do um that's what we you know i think we need I mean, please to help us with this because we completely you know we, ha we have complained we keep getting the same response back we've gone back again trying to provide the evidence and we're just getting nowhere um i suppose a legal challenge could be looked at like compassion world farming did in scotland but obviously that's time consuming and expensive and should it be up to ngos to do to do this you know um we did meet with the with the authorities last year last december and we did um suggest to them could we at least raise the age to two months um because then the calves are a lot stronger to deal with the journey um but but we're just getting nowhere so it is very frustrating um, and I, I think these these recommendations, 35 days, um, yeah, um, there's been a lot of panic over in Ireland from the farming community about that recommendation. Um, and there are welfare concerns about what would happen to the calves if they weren't exported. But um, there could be welfare issues, but there already are welfare issues. So, um, you know, and the majority of calves, there's about seven to eight hundred um, thousand milk dairy calves born here every year so the majority are already absorbed into the beef sector you know it's a relatively small amount that are, that are exported um but in, in answer i really don't know what we can do to get the the, the regulation enforced if the commission won't listen to us I, I i don't know what else we can do is basically the answer to that you know we, we need help <laughs> Thank you, uh, Caroline, and uh, uh, times are changing uh, because we will see the adoption of the ANET uh, report in, in January, and then the Commission will also start working on a revision of the one 2005. So do you think that the ANET report's recommendation as it stands now is sufficient? In relation to CARF export, I'm, yes. very, I'm very happy with it. <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely, okay. absolutely, yeah. Okay, okay, great. Thank you. Um, over to you, uh, Peter. Um, uh, Niels had two uh, very specific questions uh, for you on training and um, the two hour uh, maximum journey time. What are your thoughts, please? Yes, uh, Niels, yes, this question of using buckets, which often will have a rubber teat at the bottom of the bucket. This is a good system. I mean, because what you've got on most trucks are just these metal nipples, which the calves don't know how to use. Sometimes rubber is placed over the metal nipple, still doesn't really get us anywhere. Calves, calves can be trained to drink, you know, milk or milk replacer from a bucket. Um, the, the problem is, again, very difficult to do that while they're on a truck. You know, you've got 200 or more calves on a truck. They're given a rest of one hour. Well, it says at least one hour, but it's very rarely ever more than one hour. 
they couldn't drink from a bucket on, on their own, probably. They would need the driver to come into the truck, fill the bucket, feed calves individually. It, it's just, again, it's not practical with the big commercial loads that one's talking about. Uh, the, the, the guide to good practices for transport of cattle that I referred to actually says, look, the only way to give them this, this liquid feed is to unload them. Uh, at the one hour break, and then they can be properly and individually fed. But again, to do that properly would take quite a long while, certainly more than an hour, for somebody feeding 200 carbs. So nothing wrong with the bucket, uh, but they're not practical in the current commercial arrangements. The, the two hours, I presume. So yes, so, so what I'm just saying, no transport at all till they're five weeks old, which is good, and then only two hours. And I presume the intention there was to at least allow them to be moved to nearby farms. I mean, clearly not long distances. And I think the point here is it's interesting that the commission letter that Caroline referred to is, whereas the commission's public stance tends to be, I, you know, Ireland's doing no wrong. <clears throat> what they said in the letter, they talked about the need to replace, reduce and refine. And I'm particularly interested in replace. The, the only answer to this problem, you know, if the, if the new law comes in, is that these calves, which you know are mainly the male dairy calves, are going to have to be reared reasonably close to the farms where they've been born. You know, they could they could move two hours, and they would be reared for beef or veal, which is the current situation. But they'd be raised nearby. So, for example, I, I indicated a huge number of these journeys because the Netherlands has this huge veal industry and it doesn't produce enough of its own calves. So it's bringing in calves from the Baltic states uh, uh, and elsewhere. And, and the two hours would, would in effect say to, the, to countries like Lithuania and Poland, you can't send these calves to the Netherlands, you're going to have to rear them in your own country. Yes, they can go from the specialist dairy farm for two hours when it's the five weeks old, to a specialist beef or veal producing farm. So they're going to have to really, you know, we're never going to solve the problems of transport, not just with unweaned calves, till we reorganize uh, Europe's livestock sectors. So, and, and remember, this has been said by the Federation of Veterinarians of Europe, that animals should be slaughtered as near as possible to the farm where they're reared. But crucially, they've also said that animals should be reared on or near the farm of birth. 100% agree. So yes, you can go from one farm to another for two hours, but that's it. I hope that responds to your questions. Thank you so much, uh, Peter. And indeed, this was not only stated by FVE, but also by EFSA and the OIE. Um, so uh, two hours would indeed also um, um, urge the sector to reorganize itself. Um, so thanks so much. We have uh, more MEPs uh, who want to come in. I would like to invite Sarah Wiener now. Yes, uh, hello to everyone. I'm sorry, my English is not very good and I didn't understand everything. So pardon me if my question would cross over your answer that, that maybe don't get right. So first of all, I wanted to thank you for these excellent presentations and uh, for these uh, really heartbreaking films and pictures that goes uh, really that, that is uh, shocking. Um, I wanted to uh, do the point that uh, we here we have to do with a systematic uh, problem. Uh, what is um, not tackled with uh, technical solutions, I think, like better equipment or um, of the transporters feeding uh, through with uh, rubber tips in the truck and etc. So. Um, also, I think it's uh, we have to uh, need uh, and to understand why we have such uh, transportation at all and why so long transportation and what can we do for minimize the transport in general. I think also we don't have to forget that uh, it's maybe also breeding uh, problem. Uh, that we, we separate meat and milk and uh, calves and do, have not a, a sustainable system and we have to tackle this. this. Um, my question is, um, 
do you know really what the reason is for, for such long transportation uh, um, and is it really necessary and should local rearing farms for male calves be encouraged, maybe also financial or uh, what can we do um, also with the, um, how do you say, um, monitoring for the system uh, that on the short term what we can do and also but we have to focus also on the long term that there is no one transportation uh, for unweaned calves but you know also not transportation uh, at all um, in these circumstances that we have now. I hope it was clear what I wanted yeah, to say. Yeah, thank you, thank you Sarah and it also really builds on what uh, Peter said that uh, the industry would need to re reorganize itself but maybe Peter you can Firstly, um, uh, share your views on what is keeping this industry alive, as Sarah was asking, and what would be needed um, to, to transition to a different model. Do you have uh, thoughts on that? Thank you. Yes, if you look at some of the main journeys, so there's these huge journeys from Poland, the Baltic states, Germany, Ireland, down to Spain and Italy. I think most of those calves uh, coming from you know northern member states are going to Spain and Italy actually for beef production rather than veal. There'll be some veal, but I think it's mainly beef animals. Um, and so the problem is that you've got one group of countries with big dairy industry producing more male dairy calves that they can use in their own veal or beef sectors, and you've got Spain and Italy. Um, who've got big beef producing sectors, but not producing enough of their own calves. And so bringing them in from Northern member states. So that, that's why the trade is happening. Similarly with the Netherlands, it, it you know, over 50 or more years, it's developed this great speciality in veal production, but its own dairy industry produces just about half the calves its veal sector needs. Some of the calves that they import are coming from nearby, from Germany or Belgium, but others, as I showed, are coming from, uh, you know, the Baltic states and Ireland and Poland. Um, and again, I think the only solution to this, and it's not an easy solution, you know, but the main thing is that is going to be needed is political will from the Commission, from the member states, from obviously the Parliament, and really sticking firm to the ANIT recommendation on unweaned animals. And we're going to have to build a situation in which the countries that have too many calves, they've got one or two solutions. They either reduce their dairy sector, and just yesterday, not for the first time, the Dutch government or the, 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 the forthcoming Dutch government talked about the need to, to, to reduce the size of its livestock industry. So you either reduce your dairy herd, or in order to stop sending calves down to distant countries, you must build up in your own country a veal or beef producing industry, obviously with the animals raised to high welfare standards. In other words, you find a use for these animals in your own country. And the answer for countries that are importing lots of animals, Netherlands, Spain, Italy in particular, is I'm afraid, Netherlands, you're going to have to reduce your veal sector. You, you're not, you don't have enough calves for a veal sector that size. Spain, Italy, you've got to reduce your beef production because you don't have enough of your own calves. That clearly, these are the, re you know, re remember, I I'm old enough that I remember this debate in the 1980s when everybody was saying, look, animals must be slaughtered and reared near, you know, nearby. Um, and this has been going on for years. And of course, if, if that political decision is made, to really restructure the agriculture sector. Of course, farmers must have a, 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 you know, financial support from the commission. This would be a good way of using CAP money as opposed to currently what happens, which a lot of it's being used to actually support factory farming. So there are answers, but the, the, core, the, the core problem is one of political will. Because as, as you said, this, the, 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 this isn't about finding technical solutions. Oh, can we find some clever way of feeding cars while they're on board a truck? They shouldn't be on these trucks for these long journeys. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, Peter, for this very clear explanation. And such a change would also perfectly fit within the farm to fork strategy, which outlines that we need to shorten um, the distance between uh, rearing, fattening and, and slaughtering. So um, thanks so much for that. Uh, we move on because we have still some MEPs who would like to come in. Um, Telly Matt, the champion on this file, uh, what are your thoughts? Thank you. But uh, I see that Thomas raised his hand. Uh, I can yes. also give, to have a gender switch. <laughs> I can also give him the floor and speak after Thomas. Uh, oh no, you go now. You speak now, so yeah? it's fine. Okay. I noted I'm Thomas going. and you. Too. Yeah, we have time okay. for everyone. <laughs> thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you to Peter Stevenson and also to Caroline Rowley for their um, yeah excellent presentation. And uh, as it was already said, also very heartbreaking. I must say. Um, and uh, I want to come back with something Peter Stevenson, you have said, uh, because I had the Nils was asking the question, is it possible to train uh, calves to drink out um, uh, without sucking? But for me, it was, I saw that was really a reflex when you are very young, you cannot drink in another way by just just sucking. So I, will, I was uh, really ask again, is it really possible that they learn that to force them to drink out of a, of a buck and, and then they learn that? So that was my, my first question. And then uh, I'm happy, of course, you to hear from, from both of you that you, regarding the unwind animal, that you are uh, happy about the recommendations. And there I have two uh, questions. So not a, a general ban on unwind animals and only if they are certified uh, days old and then not, ma not more than two hours. But is there, do you see any risk of loopholes there? <laughs> because uh, you have more uh, experience and you know the ground very well. Do you see any risk of loopholes nevertheless? And then my second question uh, would be, what very concretely, and, and I think Peter, you mentioned already quite a lot of things. Um, what very concretely should be done now in order that we can do that as soon as possible without having farmers of the of the dairy uh, industry immediately on the street and a big revolution there. So what must be done in order that we can really implement that as soon as possible? And then my last question, <laughs> and I know the farmers, I'm not going to be happy with that, but uh, you said it also very clearly, one of the solution is clearly to reduce the dairy sector. Also there, my question would be to both of you concretely, uh, how do we, because I was also shadow for the farm to fork strategy, so I know around everything regarding food it's it's so taboo and 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 yeah saying reduce the dairy sector a lot of people don't want to hear that but concretely how how can we succeed that because what we see in fact is is rather increasing numbers uh increasing figures there would you say okay no let's promote really oak milk for example or would you say Oh, how realistic is it really um, to shift when you're a farmer of um, um, cow milk to shift to, to oak milk? How realistic? I saw some association who were uh, guiding farmers to do so, but it was quite hard. Oh, and I'm, I, indeed, I should, I'm not really allowed to speak about oak milk. I should say oak drink. Uh, but uh, <laughs> nevertheless, I use constantly oak milk. So how realistic do you see, do you see that shift? If you come to farmers and to say, you know, at the end of the day, what we have to do is also reduce livestock, reduce the dairy sector, um, how realistic this shift is really uh, for the farmers. Thank you. Oh, sorry. I was a lot of questions. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. And, and big questions, too. So I would like to uh, uh, ask our guests to be to be short, please. Um, uh, Peter, can you come in first and then Caroline? Uh, on uh, the, the, the loopholes of the ANET uh, report, what do we need to transition and how about reducing uh, the dairy herd uh, side also in relation to the uptake of plant-based alternatives? Thank you. Okay, yes, I'm not suggesting that the, the, the buckets uh, ah. for calves to drink from are ideal, but they are much better than trying to get them to use metal or rubber nipples. But, but clearly, these technical solutions are not what we should be looking at. It, it is about a much more far-reaching 
uh, reform. If, if the new regulation following the ANIT recommendation is well drafted, th there shouldn't be loopholes. The big problem at the moment, as I said, are these wretched words, if necessary, because many member states and transporters say, oh, it's not necessary to feed the cars after nine hours. But you know, the science is so clear that it is necessary. Um, so I don't think there should be big loopholes. Clearly, um, if we want to implement this as soon as possible, and again, being realistic, I know one's going to have to have a transition period for farmers, um, but it is going to need the Commission to very rapidly pull together a strategy, a plan that shows which countries are going to have to reduce their dairy operation, which, but possibly not just reduce dairy, but expand their nearby veal and beef to absorb these calves in a humane manner. And then there have to be plans to help farmers financially with the change. It's a, it's a big change, but it, it, it can be done and it has to be done. Of course, dairy farmers and others won't like these kind of changes. But, you know, again, farm to fork has been mentioned. There is so much science by now that's showing that in, in the developed world, in Europe, in, in the US and Australia, there has to be, for, for environmental and climate reasons, a substantial reduction in meat and dairy production. Uh, and for health reasons as well, for, for use of antibiotics reasons. Um, the, there was a study by the Rice Foundation in 2018 suggesting that if the EU is to meet it, it, its climate targets, there would have to be a reduction in, in the livestock sector of 70, 70%. These are staggering figures, but they're well supported by the science. Um, maybe to start with, one has to be talking a little less ambitiously. So we do need a big restructuring. We do need to help farmers move away from livestock. Not all farmers. I really make, want to make it clear, Compassion is not a vegetarian or a vegan society, but there need to be big, big reductions. And again, farmers must be helped to move to other things with, with technical advice and, of course, with financial support. Um, and, and just going back to one thing that arose earlier, somebody was asking, well, what, what, what can we as MEPs do to put pressure on the Commission to, to put pressure on Ireland? I think in the new year, it would really be great if the intergroup could write to the Commission about these problems, particularly with, with, with Ireland. I've, I've been involved in doing complaints to the Commission about Ireland since 1999. I, I'm sure Caroline and I would be very happy to help draft a letter initially for MPs to, MEPs to look at. Uh, I, I hope that's quick answers to these questions. Thanks. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Peter. Uh, Caroline, any quick thoughts from you? Yeah, and just to, just to add about the, the loophole. I mean, yeah, like yeah. As, as Peter said, like the regulation needs to be very clear and not open to interpretation as it currently is, because it's just so convoluted and complicated and, you know, you can do what you want for it. And um, Ireland, um, is quite unique. We're a population of 5 million and there's 7 million cattle. The dairy sector is already under the spotlight because of all the pollution and the emissions. Um, agriculture counts for a third of our emissions. Um, so dairy sector is already under the spotlight because it's been increasing over the years. And um, it's not going to be easy. There's huge pushback from the from the farming groups. They do have a lot of power in Ireland, but you know what Tilly is saying, how can we move to oat milk or whatever. I mean, Ireland years ago, Ireland used to grow a lot more crops than it does now. We aren't food secure at all. And the, you know, the bulk of the beef and dairy is exported and we import most of our fruit and veg. So the whole food system does need a complete overhaul here. It's not going to be an easy solution. And, you know, there's going to have to be supports for farmers if the calf export um, is stopped, which it will be if the, if the recommendations go through, that will be the end of it from Ireland. Um, some farmers, you know, they might not have the space to keep the calves, they might need funding for extra barns, that kind of thing. So the government is really going to have to step in and step up and um, provide supports and guidance for the farmers. You know, previously they've been encouraged to expand their dairy, which has just been completely bad advice. So, um, you know, they, they're, they're going to have to be in supports and encouragement to move into other areas. Um, but it's, it's not going to be easy and there is going to be a lot of pushback. Thank you, uh, Caroline. Uh, we are moving on uh, because time is uh, pressing. I would like to now uh, invite Thomas to come in and then Jutta and then the last round of interventions from our speakers. Thomas, please. 
Thank you, Rannick. Uh, I'll, I'll try to be short and concise. Uh, first of all, uh, it's fairly impossible to feed uh, calves, 160 or 200 calves on a truck within one hour. I mean, I'm a farmer, you know, uh, and, and I can tell you it's practically impossible if you're not unloading the calves, because how do you know which one is fed already? How do you actually even maneuver within that truck with very low you know, height? You can't even stand there as a driver. It's just not possible to do that, especially not within one hour. Um, second thing, there was a question on um, what, what did the, the the MEPs argue that we're actually blocking our positions. And um, as I, I mean, it's, it's the alternative compromises, two of three, which we pushed through, which is exactly the five weeks on calls and the two hours maximum transport times. We only managed to push through. I mean, I was the author, but it, we only pushed it through because we had all the support across all the groups. What was the argument against it? And, and uh, you know, for the liberals, as an, as an example, there was Billy Callahay uh, negotiating, who was clearly defending the interests of the industry. He was not ready to actually compromise at all or just on very minor issues. And, and uh, uh, so his argument was, uh, if the farmers need to keep the calves uh, three weeks longer, this is the end of uh, Irish agriculture, which is completely ridiculous because it's not a big investment for a farmer to actually keep his calves for another five, uh, three weeks or even five weeks or six weeks until they are eight uh, weeks old. Um, uh, it's not a big issue. And even if you, we talk about some changes in the agricultural sector. Look, if every 20th or 30s dairy farmer stops producing dairy, but rather keeps, uh, makes his business on keeping the calves until they're old enough so they can eat uh, 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 dry fodder, uh, then, then, I mean, it's not a big change in industry. Come on, you know? And it's not even preventing still transports of calves. Why I think it's super important that we get this eight hour maximum transport time overall through. So even for calves that are older than eight or maybe 10 weeks, yeah? Uh, so you can still transport them uh, uh, with uh, limitations, yeah? And not in this early age. So the Changes would be too big. Uh, Buddha, uh, who was uh, the rapporteur for EPP, I mean, he's clearly defending the interest of Romania exporting, well, hundreds of thousands of animals uh, on ships to the Middle East, um, mainly sheep in that, in that case, but also cattle. And I mean, his argument was, and this is something we, we need to take into account, his argument was, well, if the farmers can't get rid of the calves within the first 10 days or two weeks, they just kill them. Uh, and, and this is really, I mean, as awkward as it sounds, yeah, uh, this is in, in the reality of mass production, unfortunately, part of the reality. You know, the farmers get like between 30 and 80 euros for a calf. We even heard in your presentation, Caroline, that uh, even some were even giving them away for free just to find somebody to take them away. Yeah? Uh, so that's, a, that, that's really something we have to look into and also prevent that this can happen. Yeah, uh, Because, I mean, actually, we know that uh, calves are always uh, part of them of the lactation period so we could even know how many calves a farmer has so we really have to prevent that happening and that's us also even though i would like to have no transport at all of calves at that age that's why i was putting these two hours into this alternative compromise exactly what peter said uh, that that we at least allow the farming sector to transport the calves within the region to maybe specialized uh, breeders fatteners or or just just farms that keep them for another few weeks you know and professionally take care for them. Uh, interestingly, even professional calf breeders uh, I talked to in Austria are telling me we're not, we don't want the calves uh, earlier than uh, four weeks or five weeks of age, because if we buy them uh, younger, we have huge problems with immunity, with, with uh, cross infections, bacteria, because of the immunity gap. And the immunity gap is the reason why we focused on the five weeks, uh, a, a complete ban, because to my point of view, and this is also backed very much by science, calves under the five weeks are just not fit for transport. They are not, yeah? and they shouldn't be transported at all. It's not even a question whether you feed them on the way, they shouldn't be transported at all. Uh, so I, I don't think it's a so big change for the agriculture sector. Uh, just on, on, on what Peter also said, uh, in Italy, uh, most of the animals go for the home market and very much veal. In Spain, most of the animals go for actually fattening uh, and then uh, on the ships towards Middle East where we know how that looks like. Uh, which is even worse. And, and so um, to not get too long, I have to 
two, actually three concrete questions to Caroline. Did you ever try to actually uh, start a court case against the official veterinarian signing up the, the travel papers? Because that's how in Austria, I actually stopped them uh, tricking uh, with, you know, they, they what they did is they accepted as a point of destination, uh, a collection center in South Tyrol, where, where this was not the point of destination. They were just regrouped and transported to Spain. And I just started a legal case against the official veterinarians, which how I mentioned managed actually to stop that practice, uh, at least. So did you ever try that? And what response was from, from the courts? Uh, did they pick it up? And the second question I have, and this is maybe maybe more towards Peter. I mean, what, what I still don't understand is all these animals are fattened with imported fodder, basically. So after they, they arrive, yeah, and then they're fattened uh, towards beef or even veal with, you know, soy or, or, or mainly imported fodder. And that fodder costs approximately the same. I mean, it's, it's cheaper, closer to the harbor of Rotterdam. That's, in, that's why my Netherlands, but, but I mean, it, why, I mean, in Spain, you know, I've seen the feedlots there. There's no grassland. It's a semi-desert where they, they keep these animals and they have to buy all the fodder. How can it be kind of cheaper or economically viable uh, to actually do the fattening there and not uh, within, I don't know, Denmark Island or wherever? Is it because uh, in Spain, animal welfare standards are even less checked, controlled, or surveilled than in, in Central Europe? Or do you have any other explanation for that? Thank you. Thank you so much, Thomas. Um, given uh, the time, we move on to YouTube, please. I will in. be very brief. I, I agree with so many of the colleagues. I think there have been excellent interventions. And I, I, I just... Uh, my, my feeling is definitely after these years and also hearing this seminar today that uh, we should stop uh, transporting animals. It should be meat and we should not at all. This is not sustainable. It's awful. Uh, that's my only, this is the no normal reaction. I think everyone should have when listening to how the system works. Uh, and then of course, in the, in the way to get there, many of the things that colleagues have said about the cults and how we need to, to protect them from going too early and everything around it I definitely support uh, but I would like to hear I, I like the the thing that Thomas said about uh, uh, the veterinarians and make sure you have the court involved there. Uh, but I'm also thinking about responsibility a lot here, that it feels like everyone is blaming everyone. Politicians are blaming, uh, not uh, interfering in it and uh, yet deciding over it. And then we have the uh, the farmers who don't know where their animals are going. I heard in one of our uh, seminars that uh, there were uh, farmers in in Austria who didn't know that their uh, animals were going to Spain and get uh, and all the travel around it. So they they kind of don't care where they are going or are ignorant or something. And then we have also maybe the public who, who, who also the system continues and it never becomes the big thing. It never becomes the big thing against the politicians. So I wonder how we could uh, make people aware of their own responsibility in this. And especially also um, if farmers put their animals on this trip that will go on for very long and they, they are ignorant about it, there should be some uh, responsibility. You had the animals, you were responsible until they are slaughtered. You are responsible the whole way. It should be some kind of conscience there. And I don't know how to create that. And I wonder if uh, someone could answer it, how we could put some responsibility back where it belongs. Thank you, Jitte. Um, Anja, I also know you have some burning questions, so maybe just come in now so uh, our guests can uh, respond in one go. Well, thank you so much, uh, Reineke. Yes, yeah, some of these questions already uh, were answered okay. uh, by the expert, but I, I, I have uh, uh, one, one for for Peter. Uh, well, Peter, sometimes I'm, I'm, I'm really ashamed that I'm, I'm Dutch. Uh, uh, looking at the numbers, uh, and uh, I, I have a question for you. The, the calves that um, uh, come from the Netherlands uh, and go to, for instance, Ireland, uh, no. Italy, I mean, uh, we import from Ireland, but we export, for instance, to Italy or Spain. Are, are they 
uh, then going to be fattened there uh, or are they immediately slaughtered at that age or are they uh, transported further uh, or even exported outside of the EU? Uh, and one question to, to Caroline, we, we often hear that, that Ireland needs to keep their exports and they come up with, with ridiculous arguments, as we heard from Thomas as well, that, that all the farmers will have to stop and that the animals will have to be killed uh, on the farm. Um, but um, uh, they, they even uh, come up with, with, in, in, with some other ideas. Uh, the, uh, for instance, to transport animals by air, um, uh, to, to transport the cows from uh, Ireland to, to the Netherlands uh, in an airplane. Um, I, uh, in the Netherlands, we see more and more uh, farmers that keep their, their calves on the farm uh, until they are weaned and, and leave them with their mothers. Um, uh, they can drink there. It's also a good economic model because of uh, 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 less mastitis, less antibiotics, etc. cetera. Um, so what do you think, Caroline, is the best solution for this, uh, to tackle this problem? Uh, transport by air or uh, leave the cows with their mothers or even better, uh, uh, stop drinking dairy so much? It seems like you know the answer to this question, Anja, but uh, happy to uh, uh, ask it to Caroline. Caroline, could you come in on the question on uh, the court case um, and whether you yeah. have considered that and also about Anja's question and then we move to Peter. Okay. Um, now, with regard to the court case, um, after that, myself and Peter did actually um, compile a letter. There's, there's two veterinary um, authority groups in Ireland. We wrote to both of them. Um, about the what's mainly about export outside the EU, and they both kind of came back saying nothing to do with us. We're just doing our job. Um, I haven't actually thought about a court case. We didn't get that far. Um, we just we just um, wrote to them about it. And um, but I did meet with um, the Veterinary Island Group a few months ago to see if they would um, kind of make a statement against the the, the sector. But um, again, that hasn't gone anywhere. But so yeah, basically no. Um, I haven't thought about a court case, not not from that side. Um, so um, now it's, it's interesting what Anya said because um, actually in the, the we had a new um, election last year in, in the program for government. There was talk about calf and foot dairy farms. Um, I know it's something that's um, in, it's a practice that's increasing around the world and in the Netherlands. I know there's some commercial calf and foot dairy farms and there's one in Scotland. So it is something that the government is actually looking at. Um, they are conducting some trials at the, the Tagish um, research facility. So I'm hoping that is something that will be looked at. But the main problem here, whenever any suggestions are made about changes, as I'm sure you, you've, you've seen from like the likes of Billy Kelleher, everything's an attack on rural Ireland. So there's always a pushback. It's an attack on rural Ireland. It's the death of rural Ireland. So it, it is very difficult here. But, um, you know, as I was saying before, it's going to need a lot of support and um, you know decisive action by the government because the farming lobby groups have so much power. It, it's, it's very difficult, but certainly calf at foot dairy farms are something that we could look at. Dual purpose breeds, um, sex semen, so that the calves have more value because as well as the calves getting exported when they're older, they get exported to Libya. Um, huge amounts of male Frisian bulls get exported to Spain that end up who knows where. Um, so at the end of the day, really, we have to reduce the herd. We've got too many animals in this country. As I said, that we, there's a pollution issue as well. So we, we have to reduce the herd and transport by air. But, um, this year, there were meant to be some trials going on, but that's just ridiculous. You know, flying calves, it's not economically viable and just the stress that it will cause. is just absolutely ridiculous. Um, that's desperation, really. Mm -hmm. um, and it would, it would still be a long journey. Um, so, but Fortunately, the trials um, where they use COVID as an excuse, but um, I think they just realised that it's just it's just not economically viable. So that's not going to happen, as far as thank I'm aware. you, Caroline. Okay, um, Peter, could you come in on the remaining questions on the fodder, who was responsible, and the transportation from the Netherlands to Italy, please? Uh, I think the point that, that, that Thomas made about the fodder is absolutely crucial. Uh, I think feedlots are an appall from a welfare point of view, an appalling way of raising uh, cattle, uh, and therefore I don't think this should be happening. Um, but th this is a wider question than there's the dairy sector. The EU livestock sector as a whole is a huge importer of soy from South America and that contributes to deforestation. So it just simply shouldn't be 
feeding soy to, to farm animals. Even more worrying, though people are less somehow aware of it, the, the commission has admitted, it's on their website, that almost two thirds of all EU cereals, you know, wheat, barley, oats, maize, are being used to feed animals. Study after study shows that animals convert these very inefficiently into meat and milk. It's also been this huge need of the livestock sector, the intensive livestock sector for cereals as feed has fueled the intensification of crop production, which with its monocultures and agrochemicals has led to uh, overuse and pollution of water, soil degradation, biodiversity loss. So many of the ambitions of the biodiversity strategy and of farm to fork cannot be met if we don't stop using almost two thirds of our cereals to feed animals. So there's a, there's a huge issue here. There are many studies now showing that livestock only make a proper contribution, an efficient contribution uh, to food security when they're converting materials we can't consume into food we can eat. So there are all sorts of reasons for rethinking how we farm animals. On the responsibility point, yeah, you could be we could be really radical and say, look, if a farmer is sending his animals, whether they're cattle, calves, pigs, whatever, on long journeys, then they lose their entitlement to any support under the CAP. You can't have both. You can't both have benefit from taxpayers' money and engage in activities that many taxpayers feel are cruel. Uh, sorry, I'm being quick because I know we're probably running out of time. Anya, you, you were asking about the car. It's this rather bizarre situation that the, the, the Netherlands both is a big importer of cars, but also exports them down to Italy. I don't know why that's happening, uh, given it needs so many cars, but they will be going to Italy. Thomas said that in Italy and, and it is more veal than beef, but either way, yes, they'll, they'll, they'll be fattened in Italy. And, and, and as Caroline said, we've got, looking now for a moment at Spain, we've got a lot of evidence that many of the calves coming from Northern Europe to Spain are fattened for a few months and then re-exported to countries like Libya and Lebanon. And, you know, in all the years I have been working, I have never seen anything as utterly horrific as slaughterhouses in the Middle East and North Africa. Again, I'd like to, I'd love to see the intergroup add this to the, the very long list of things that need attention in the coming couple of years. Um, this is not an anti-Muslim statement. Whenever Muslims see our films, they are horrified. They say, this is not halal. This is this cruel treatment of animals mm. is not what, we, but they do not know, they don't have the expertise to actually know how to change the way they handle the animals. This is not an issue about stunning or not stunning. It's about how the animals are handled. I think I ought to stop there. Thank you, Peter. And also thank you for adding this uh, to the debate. And of course, it will be of tremendous help if the final ANET um, uh, committee's report would call for a ban on live exports. We, we won't have solved all the problems um, in third countries, but it will be a very important uh, step. So, oh yeah, I'm handing back to you. This was uh, your last uh, meeting chairing the intergroup uh, session. This is also a topic so close to uh, your heart. And uh, I didn't want to cut the discussion. So I'm sorry we ran a bit uh, later, but I think it's, it's, it's very, very important. So Anya, over to you for your closing remarks. Yes, thank you, Reineke. Um, well, uh, to conclude, I, I, I would like to thank all the speakers uh, for the informative presentations and the constructive uh, discussions. Uh, we must not forget that the suffering of unweaned animals, uh, especially unweaned calves, in the revision of uh, Regulation 1 2005 on the protection of animals during transport, as well as the revision of the animal welfare legislation uh, in general. So I encourage all of you to participate in the ongoing public cons consultation. Uh, on animal welfare. The, the deadline is uh, set on the 21st of January 2022. And uh, uh, we as members of the intergroup um, will try to fight the, the transport of unweaned calves uh, through the uh, uh, amendments we will table on the uh, 
and its committee uh, recommendations. And I heard also, I saw in the chat box, an interesting remark from uh, Andreas Manns about uh, uh, using the school milk program as well. We will most certainly do that. So as you said, Reineke, this is uh, my last uh, uh, meeting I will be chairing uh, uh, as a president of this intergroup. So um, uh, before we go to the uh, listening to the, uh, the uh, probably new president of the intergroup, uh, I would like to, to uh, say some, some words. It has been a great honor to be uh, the president of this animal welfare intergroup. Uh, even though we were only able to organize online meetings uh, during the last two and a half, uh, well, over two, two years now, um, the, this intergroup was able to organize our monthly meetings online. Uh, we organized several events uh, and, and I will remember especially our, our meetings on uh, COVID-19 pandemic, uh, zoonotic diseases uh, from wildlife trade and consumption, and also from intensive livestock farming. Um, I, I re will remember the, the welfare of uh, galgos and greyhounds, uh, the meeting on welfare of turkeys, well, so many other topics, but, but also, of course, the exchange of views with our commissioner, Stella Kiriakides. Um, we even kept animal welfare uh, high on the agenda together. Uh, and it was an interesting time where with the Europe, uh, European Citizens Initiative and the Cage Age, with the realization of the Inquiry Committee on Animal Transport, the, the usefulness and power of the in this intergroup has been proven again. And I will definitely be, uh, miss being the intergroup president, but I will continue to, to fight just as hard for, for animals. I'd like to thank everyone at the intergroup secretariat uh, and my assistants, uh, especially um, I would like to thank Mandy and Andreas uh, for all their support, the preparation of the meetings, the, the letters, uh, so much work uh, they have uh, done the last two, two and a half years. Um, and um, for now, I think we uh, go for, uh, to listen to our candidate for the new presidency of this intergroup. Uh, so I will move to, to a short hearing of our candidate. Uh, the intergroup secretariat and I received one statement of intent of, uh, for the role of president uh, for the intergroup of the second half of the term, uh, Miss Tilly Metz uh, from the Greens. Uh, she has put herself forward and would like to give, I would like to give her the floor uh, so that she can speak about her motivations, her plans to lead this intergroup until the end of this term. Uh, dear Tilly, uh, please, you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, dear Anja. And first of all, let me thank you for your amazing work that you have been doing all those years in not easy times. And uh, I hope, of course, that you will be uh, as regularly as, as now in the intergroup uh, and, and go on the fight for that. I'm sure you will do. Um, the motivation behind all my efforts as a politician and as an activist to fight all forms of exploitation and abuse of power. I mean, that's the red line. If I look a bit at my, at my fights, I have always felt a need to protect animals. And even as a child, I remember very well, I, 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 I went to, when I went to school, I picked up the worms and, and the snails from the street and to put them into the grass uh, in order that they are safe and not being trampled over or run over. And I think most children have this innate um, empathy for animals, but as you all know, many adults then somehow lose it. Um, when I became a vegetarian years ago, it was really like also reconnecting uh, with the innocence and empathy of childhood. Um, now I could never go back. I must say working to be a vegan, not yet there, but uh, that's, that's one of my projects, of course. And in the European Parliament, it has been my pleasure and privilege to be one of the vice um, 
presidents of this intergroup under the chairship of Anya, who has done, as I said already, an excellent job as uh, chair. I have greatly appreciated and enjoyed the good collaboration between all of us. And I don't think really that there is another policy areas where the cooperation is so open, no matter uh, which political color you are from. And all of the victories we achieve are common victories. As a president of the animal welfare interview, this is the spirit I would like, if you support me, I would like to, to keep. Let me come have a look on the on the some of our achievements that we had together. Together, we gathered the necessary signatures and pushed our colleagues to finally get an inquiry committee on animal transport, which I had really the honor and challenge to share uh, since September 2020. Over a year later, the result is not perfect, I know yet, but we still can be quite proud, I think, of how far we have have come. And I must say honestly, as a former teacher, I always tend to see the progress made, but without ignoring the way that we still to go. The same can be said, and Anya mentioned it, for the NDKH, for which many of us mobilize citizens and uh, policy makers directly. Here I'm thinking, of course, of Anya and Eleonora did a particularly uh, fantastic job. So now we have finally commitments on the table, also on that. In parallel, I also had the honor uh, of chairing the working group of animal and science and um, our objective was the adoption of an EP resolution asking really for the phasing out uh, of animal testing with the help of all of you and here particularly let me also mention you we achieved really this goal in September of this year. Um, in the past years. I have integrated, I must say, animal welfare consideration in every file, in every debate, in every interview, where it was possible. Of course, I'm thinking there of the cap, I'm thinking of the farm to fork strategy, I'm thinking of the pharmaceutical strategy, and I will, of course, in any case, continue to do so. So, dear colleagues, I hope I have found, um, I have your confidence and trust to be the next president of the intergroup. By now, uh, I want you really to know that my door is always going to be open to work together, to hear your proposals, demands, suggestions. Um, and I would bring to table also um, a realistic view. I have this realistic view to need also uh, of the need to work together with all the different stakeholders. I know it's a tough business uh, and, and sometimes very heartbreaking, but I still have hope and most of all the strong belief that together we can move mountains to make the change for millions of animals. Thank you very much for listening. Well, thank you so much, uh, Tilly, for your presentation. Um, I will now open the floor for any questions uh, you may have or statements you want to make. Uh, other, um, um, looking especially to the other members of the intergroup. Uh, Reineke, I cannot see if people no, are. Yeah. Floor, so I see that Jutte has a has a question, and Martin, Jutte. I have no question. No. I just would like to. Uh, express my support for Tilly and I admire her work and I've seen it in action and uh, that's the only thing I like to say. Thank, thank you. you so much, Jute. Martin? Uh, thank you. No, I in indeed uh, have a question. Uh, Tilly, will you try to do as good job as you did as a chairman of the uh, ANIT committee? <laughs> now, full support. Uh, full support. <laughs> thank you. And, and also belated as I had to join I join later. Uh, big thank you to you, Anya, for, for all the hard work in, uh, let's say, not very standard circumstances, which, you know, uh, made, for example, our usual uh, meeting in Strasbourg quite impossible. And yeah, that has, that's, that's an extra appreciated. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Caroline Roth. 
Uh, yeah, thank you. No question for me. Um, just um, thank you well, Anya. And um, et, et, et tu as toute ma confiance, Silly. Uh, tu le sais. Uh, je sais ton investissement par rapport aux animaux, par rapport à la commission d'enquête, ce qu'on a vécu tout à l'heure uh, en, en commission, enfin en plénière uh, sur les cirques. On sait ton implication. Donc uh, je suis avec toi à 200 Et encore merci, Anya. Thank you so much, uh, Caroline. Um, she just said for the uh, English speaking listeners that uh, Tilly has your full uh, support and a uh, huge uh, congrats to Anya for her passionate work. Uh, Maria Nogel, please. Thank you. I would like to say thank you to Anya once more and to, uh, well, welcome to Tilly. And I think um, I'm from the SD group, and you know the SD group are always split. Part of the group, sorry, this is the reality, a part of the group stand for the past, okay, in these issues. But a part of the group, and I would say this is, this is uh, I, for my, for example, or we have uh, other uh, um, colleagues from my party in, in the meeting, we fight for good animal uh, welfare standards and we fight for a good together, the, 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 the people and the animals are, I think, together. And I think we should we should try it uh, to, for Tilly for them uh, in, in the new year 2020-20 that uh, we fight for an invitation for Tilly uh, for the SNT group. And I think it is so important. It is so important that we, we get more and more and more. Um, it is I think this for me uh, uh, the best pos position from this uh, intergroup. This is not a closed closed group, and we are the best. And all other outside are not so good as I. Uh, I think we have to understand, and this is really great in this group, that we can only change something if we get a majority. And we have always have open doors and the doors open. And if, if there is a, a question from outside and should we do this so or that, then it is important important to make the, the, the hands open and the door open and say, come, we, we tell us the situation, we show us the situation, show you the situation. This is so important. And I think um, I, I, uh, I'm from the agriculture committee and uh, everybody knows there is the situation really, really crazy. And, but we have to, we have always to open the door. And I would, I would say I will fight uh, in 2020-20 that Tilly could uh, uh, be uh, um, as a guest in the in the SNT group, I think it is very important. The intergroup is very very uh, strong intergroup, and this this uh, um, this year was a year. Uh, I think uh, the headline of 2021 was the headline: animal welfare is is absolutely important. And thank you, Tilly, for do the new job, and thank you, Anya, for do the job in the past. Thanks so much, Maria, for sharing those passionate words. Uh, Anya, uh, also lots of uh, uh, congrats to you in the chat and support for Tilly. So I think we can move to the official appointment. Thank you very much. <laughs> yes, I, I, I would like to say uh, uh, a few words. Uh, uh, it is absolutely clear, Tilly, um, that your appointment as the new president of uh, this intergroup is, uh, is a fact. Um, I wish you a lot of luck and success, uh, but also a lot of uh, courage and uh, determination. And I am very confident that you will succeed uh, uh, the next uh, half of this term. Uh, Tilly, congratulations. The floor is yours. Thank you very much uh, to all of you. And I know uh, you are <laughs> by now also probably hungry, but thank you very much, uh, Anja. Your support is very important for me. And thanks to all of you for your empowering words. And I can assure you that I really will do my best, at least as good that as a chair of the ANIT committee, I will fight for uh, animal welfare, animal rights. And with pleasure, I, I, I would go also, I agree already, thank you uh, to Maria Neuschel for any invitation where I can defend the animal welfare I will do so so with pleasure and I'm looking forward to work with the whole team and all the members of the animal welfare intergroup so uh, yeah enjoy looking forward for next week to work with all of you and enjoy uh, your holidays and the feast of the end of the year and take care all of you thanks everyone happy Christmas Thank you. Bye-bye.